Hey, welcome to the Inward Investing Podcast. I'm Mike Ritter. And I'm Todd Whalen. And we are the back. The Inward Investing Podcast. We are the Inward <laughs> Investing Podcast, and we are back from a brief hiatus. Last week, uh, we published the interview with Ryan McKenzie. Woo woo. And he is absolutely uh, a fantastic interview. One of the coolest things that he said in that show um, was he, he talked about how people have the need to take a day, take a day off rest and have all of this. Like it, it's like cool to struggle now. And he said that he finds that, you know, if, if he believes that he needs rest and believes that he needs to take time off or he believes that he's struggling, he actually does struggle a lot more than if he uses positive psychology and, just does something different rather than just taking a day completely off or believes that, you know, like he's breaking down. A lot of it is psychological for him. And he finds that the, by shifting what he's working on, he can stay productive over time rather than doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, I forgot who it was, but they had like, I think it was five or 15 minute like projects every five or 15, like I think it was 15, maybe 10. I don't know. <laughs> fives and tens just seemed like a good number but it was like every say 10 minutes you'd switch topics completely i think you may even talk to me about that before yeah right like so you're working on a project 10 minute like set a timer boom all right now i'm going on to something else like okay i'm cutting the lawn for 10 minutes boom now i'm doing dishes for 10 minutes and then boom i'm going back to my writing for 10 minutes and you know you just keep alternating and doing stuff like that so you know, that's a really cool way just you know de-stress yourself by not having to focus on it so intently that you forget about other things and then your brain will probably work better when you're actually like oh i only have 10 minutes to get this done ready go yeah i think yeah i i have this book called brain science for principles and it's you know i i got it, it when i was doing a lot of research or for principles for like school principles oh okay All right. yeah that's when, and i was right. so i was doing it when i was writing my book, which is should be done with, by the year 2050. Um, yeah, and that's all about family health and everything. So I got this book because it was a lot of literature and science on how physical activity, diet, sleep, stress, exercise affects learning behaviors in the school. And so it was all it was pretty dry, but it was just a collection of research that this author feels like principals should have in their hands so they can use use it to shape their learning environments and one of the things in there was i remember this stat i think it was something along the lines of attention spans and heightened learning last about 20 minutes and if you hear crying in the background by the way that's baby blaze she's been she's been attending just about every show but this is the first time she's been on air um but yeah so they said that heightened learning and peak learning lasts about 15 to 20 minutes in school aged children. And since my mind has never really developed past the seventh grade, I felt like, you know, that's me right there in a nutshell. And that my peak learning probably only lasts 20 minutes. Now, are there people that can go beyond that? Yes, but we find that stress and diminishing returns, everyone has a breaking point. And eventually, if you work on the same thing repetitively over time, you have a diminishing return in your learning capacity, your attention span, and your ability to be productive doing that task. There is a limit. And you know that's, this brings us to our topic today, which is healthy ways to cope with stress. And we're going to share some of our stories in our life, and maybe you can identify with it. And maybe we can put something into your playbook that can help you. But before we get into it, we're going to install a segment, which we're going to do every show, two of them actually. One is going to be our favorite dad jokes of the week, which you can't escape a good dad joke. I think everyone can appreciate that. Matter of fact, it's more on necessity because I just have a lot stockpiled <laughs> yes. and I got to get them out. Um, so I don't know if you have one, but I'll share one. All right, go Todd, on. my dad joke of the week. What's brown and sticky? Um, well, since Blaze is here. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. What? A stick. Uh, uh, <laughs> all right. Do you have one? Of course um, you do. Yes, I do. I'm going to tell the long, the long uh, prom one. Okay, let's go for it. All right. So, boy's going to prom. He's got to go get his flowers. So, he goes to the flower shop. Super long line. 
waiting in line, waiting in line, waiting in line. Finally gets to the front of the line, and they have his flower still, and he's so excited. Oh, thank God. He goes later that day to the tux place to get his tux, and oh, again, super long line. You know, he sees all the tuxes flying off the shelves, but luckily they have the one he wants in his size. So frustrating. Whew, lucky Thank man. You. Next day he goes to the limo store, another super long line. He's waiting and waiting and waiting, finally gets to the front of the line. He gets the last limo. Lucky, lucky man. Then he's, you know, it's prom day. Everything's going perfect. You know, he's dancing with his girlfriend. The flowers are beautiful. The tux is beautiful. The limo ride was perfect. And she's like, oh, hey. I want a drink. Can you go get me some punch? So he's like, sure. He walks over. There's no punch line. <laughs> oh. Have, oh. You, have you told me that before? I, I don't know. I thought I did. That. No? <laughs> I thought I did. <laughs> what a cliffhanger. <laughs> Do you get oh, it, Mike? Yeah, oh, I get it. <laughs> oh, I get it. I got to recover from that. <laughs> That's like the... Uh, the Pat Davidson joke. Yeah, it, we'll, <laughs> we'll save, save that, that for next week. The, yeah. the um, <laughs> well, other than looking <laughs> up at, up dad jokes, what have you been up to over the last couple days? Um, I watched the Bohemian Rhapsody this weekend. Which that was, movie is awesome. Which is pretty awesome. Could have been about twenty minutes shorter. Um, yeah, I mean, but it was it was good. It was crazy. I don't know, like. I wonder how much was like dramatized for like movie to make it more intense and how much of it was real. Like some of the fights between the band, like yeah. they just like amp those up a little bit. Oh, I'm one hundred percent. The the part uh, about uh the anyone bites the dust yeah. thing, like I'm sure it didn't work that way where they're like fighting each other like and No, you, you need to get out and the yeah, the bass player they just like, like goes two or dun, three times that dun, movie. Dun. <laughs> Da, 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 and everyone just stops fighting. Like they were fighting about legitimate stuff. They had legitimate things yeah. to work out with each other. And he just starts playing. He played three notes, yeah. and everyone yeah. stopped yeah. arguing, turned their heads slowly to him. That's a nice riff, mate. Can you play it again? <laughs> yeah, and then like our British accents sound yeah. Australian. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and our Australian accents sound British. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> um, and our South African accents sound like both. Uh, do I have an accent, by the way? Um, I think I'm getting off topic here, but I... I don't know, maybe. But people say I have an accent, because I'm from Buffalo. Super northern. <laughs> but anyway, what were your t- big takeaways from Bohemian Rhapsody? Um, well, like I said, I don't know if it was dramatized. I mean, it was a great movie. If you didn't see it, see it. You know, I've been a Queen fan since my parents had it on the record player in the vinyl back in the day. Um, and, like, they also just, like... You know, he was like, in the beginning of the movie, it was like 1970, and then they were on like a world tour in 1975, which is like freaking crazy. That he wasn't even in the band. Like, the band singer quit, and then they formed Queen, and they just like listened to everything he said. He's like, oh, I'm just going to sing different lyrics the first time I'm on stage to your song. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, okay. And I'm just going to do this. And like, no one questioned, I mean, outfits were weird back then, but like, he came in like some weird clothes, and they were just like, Okay, I'll dress like that now too. <laughs> so Did it weird. really happen that yeah. way? So there's another good documentary on Queen that's pretty dry, but it's on Amazon Prime. And so there are some discrepancies between the movie and the documentary. I tend to trust the dry documentary as far as facts goes, yeah, because of how unenterta- unentertaining <laughs> it was. <laughs> and there was a couple of things that were a little different there, but. My big my big takeaway was I didn't know half of the songs that were played by Queen. I didn't know were Queen, Queen songs. Like, I know them, but, like, Under Pressure, no idea that was really? a Queen song. I, knew that. Um, I didn't know that he had long hair. And then watching some videos now, like, this weekend of him with, like, long hair and no mustache, so weird. Super weird. Super like, weird. Who's that guy? I, if I you showed me a picture of Freddie Mercury with his... Like, in his wife beater with, like, his little, like, spiked cuff around his bicep, mustache and, like, buzz cut hair, and then a long hair picture. I'd be like, I don't know who that is. That's Freddie Mercury and some other guy. Right. <laughs> right. Who's this old singer of Queen? I, <laughs> I didn't see, um, or I didn't listen to Queen too much when I was younger. I mean, it was a little past me. Like, I was born in 83 and started paying attention to things 
in like 93. Once Florida State won a national championship in 1993, then I actually cared about everything else in the world. Just <laughs> somehow that's some of my first memories. But yeah, Queen wasn't really on my radar, so I didn't know half the stuff that they played was theirs. Uh, under pressure, the crazy little thing called love. I could, I would have bet you my life that was an Elvis song. I had no idea. Yeah. So I think some of those, Mike. I don't know. I mean, they could be a remake. I have no idea. I hear songs now that are remakes that I didn't even know that were like remakes um, that are more popular than the original versions. And like, how would you like? How would that make you feel if like someone came out with like the Invest Inward <laughs> podcast <laughs> or something like that, like and talked like the same exact things that we said but they like talked the same thing we <laughs> <Yes>. said <laughs> yeah. i have i have a strong <laughs> you have a strong i have a talking. strong instinct that no one's going to copy this podcast <laughs> <laughs> or like uh say your book that you're coming out with like you yeah. come out with it it's out for 10 years you sell like eight copies hopefully not but then someone else comes out with a book practically the same information same topic and sells like it's like number one bestseller yeah. Well, actually, come to think of it, for those of you listening, I do have a little PSA. Uh, so some of you may or may not know, I do some videography as a oh, hobby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, paid, paid vi- yeah. you know, hobby. And so I do, I, I only do it if it's fun. Like, I like doing ridiculous stuff. I was always a fan of South Park, Adult Swim, okay. things that are just ridiculous and, you know, I like humor that has an intelligent undertone, but is ridiculous. You know, the ridiculousness and humor why, is what gets people to watch. Why but are then you on it has the Inward little... Investing podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. But the so I made a skit for a realtor, and the skit was about two minutes long, um, and it's you're just trying to get some views and make it likable. So the assistant to this realtor brings in some closing papers. She starts filling it out. And as soon as she signs her name, music starts playing heavy metal music, lights are going on, everything's flashy. And then it freaks the intern out a little bit or the assistant. And she asks the realtor, what just happened? Why, what, how did you do that? And then (laughs) the realtor starts messing with her a little bit. And every time her pen touches the paper to close on a house, rock music starts playing and it's her close boom anthem. Anyways, it's probably it's way funnier than uh, than I'm <laughs> probably making funny. it sound. But yeah. we had a lot of views. It got successful, and so that got enough traction to where some of her friends and colleagues were asking me via email and Facebook Messenger how we did it, what what do I use to edit, and it got a lot of traction. And then I find out one of the people that I helped created their own skit, word for word, frame to frame, everything identical, just about. They did it in a really crappy way. But they did it almost identically to what, what I did. And that was the first time I, I even had to deal with something like that where, you know, I'm out, outwardly trying to help someone. And they just flat out rip off, you know, our original work. You know, I didn't want to be a D-bag about it. And, but at the same time, you know, I did have a little issue with helping someone out and, someone out and then they, you know, rip word for word our work. So I did ask her politely to take it down, and it's still up. Oh. You know, the video is still up on Facebook, and so I don't know. I don't know what to do about it. Legal action. What do I do? I, I need emails. I need some help on this one. Yes. I mean, it's not worth, you know, creating a big ordeal about it, but uh, to one extent. Ordeal. Not a big ordeal. Humongous. Tw- yeah. I mean, this la- the realtor paid for it. We wrote the skit. She's actually using it for some of her branding, this clothes boom idea. And it's funny and it's hilarious. And I, what do you do in that situation? You know, I'm not yeah, Paramount yeah. Pictures, but, you know, you don't want people just straight up ripping Blaze, your work. Blaze just laughed at you when you said you're not Paramount Pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're she not knows. Paramount Pictures either, Blaze. <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of annoying. You know what else annoys me, Mike? The cost of daycare for children. In astronomical. Especially like, so it gets a little cheaper when the kid is older, when you have to do less. Right? Yeah. Like, okay. But also, like, my child's in a car seat or like in a little pack and play, like 98% of her life or sleeping. You know, like, why is it like $1,000 a month for like some daycare or more? Well, I think it just depends. They don't have to do anything. 
Well, I think it depends on the perspective you're looking at. Because if you divide it up by day, what is it, like 50, 60 bucks a day? Well, if you're watching somebody else's kid who doesn't belong to you. It's true. 50, 60 bucks sounds pretty $50 cheap. a day. Sounds like I'm life. undercharging. And you can have, like, what, like 12 hours? Yeah. <laughs> it's like $3 an hour. It's like three bucks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends which. $3 an hour. Yeah, I, that's, that's one of those hidden using costs. It all day, every day, if you're off a parent and don't want to see your child. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound that ridiculous when you're on the other end. And But that is one of those hidden costs so of, thing about is kids film. that you don't talk about. No one talks about that until you get on the other side of the cornfield. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, you got to get a Ford diapers and food and yeah, diapers are the least that diaper is the least expensive cost out of everything yeah um see but the thing is if i could pay by like day or hour a little more than five dollars an hour or whatever fine but it's like as a baby like you can only pay like it's this much a month yeah no matter if you're there one hour that month or every single hour yeah and then it's like, well, I want to be, have time with my child, but I'm getting my money's worth, so uh, <laughs> see you later. Yeah. So that's why Blaze is in the podcast with us right now. Yeah, you got to do it yourself. In I find that the, the most expensive studio. commodity on earth is time. Yes, sir. Right? You ask somebody to spend time on something that means something to you and not to them, that's going to be really expensive. You know, some of our services, people would say is probably expensive the personal training and coaching end of things but you're getting time expertise like a lot of those intangible things cost more than physical goods can't put a price on someone's life and health amen to that so if speaking you c- of that our prices just went up 900 percent. absolutely <laughs> so now if you're listening to this in reverse we podcast we are charging your credit card we're charging you credit cards. Nine hundred percent more than we were. <laughs> Thank you for sponsoring the show. <laughs> yes. So since you're paying top dollar for this thing, let's go ahead and get to the meat and potatoes. Right. So the oh. title of today's show is Adulting One Hundred and One, and I think Blaze just took a ginormous. <laughs> no, poop. I think so. Oh, face is red. The face is red. Heavy breathing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Just I, got like, the, I got the fan blowing towards you, Mike, though, so <laughs> you'll be the one to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of paying all this money and adulting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much for lasting this long. Okay. Uh, so today's show is called Adulting 101, and Todd and I have some unique lives and some unique uh, stories to share that relate to stress, stress coping, and fragility syndrome, I think. And not too many people really understand that there are healthy ways to cope with stress and unhealthy ways to cope with stress. A lot of people are under the impression also that their ultimate goal is to get rid of stress in their life. That is a major myth. And I think when you come from that perspective, you're going to make decisions that are unhealthy to help cope with stress would end up backfiring. Let me explain. In our situations, we are business owners. Okay, we work as contractors responsible for all of our own advertising, our scheduling, the intake of our clients, the execution of sessions, the upkeep of our clients outside of of the sessions, which means emailing, texting, moral support, motivation, communication, um, paying, Psych- paying for all the psychology, um, possibly writing newsletters, doing these podcasts. Um, we do a lot outside of our sessions. We're also the accountant in most cases, you know, with the exception of the end of the year, I'll delegate all that, but all of the logging of my finances, um, any advertising costs that's factored in the writing of the advertising, meaning the copyright, and if you're going to do like a Facebook ad that's written by us, it's not like we have some company that's doing that for us. All of the video that is done on this podcast, filmed and edited here in-house by me. Um, any advertising that you do on Facebook, writing that Instagram post. Some people don't have jobs where they, where it, they need 
Instagram or Facebook or marketing or marketing at all. Um, and if they do have marketing, it's not on them. We wear 10 to 12 hats. You know, that, that's just professionally like add yeah. father into the mix. Father is different than husband. It sounds the same, but it's different. It's a little bit of a switch mindset. And if it was the same, it'd be weird and it'd be called incest and you'd go to jail. And you would be on a TV show called Game of Thrones. <laughs> yes. True story. <laughs> and it's, we have put ourselves in a position that is extraordinarily re- rewarding. I, I'm not going to lie. There have been times in my career where I've thought about doing other things. I know you have. You used to be a teacher. You've, done, you've worn a bunch of hats before. And, you know, there's always the allure of financial security. There's always the allure of having schedule. maybe an, a set schedule. I mean, that's one thing that wears me down. There are certain things that in everyone's life, listeners who have different jobs, you have different stressors that weigh differently on you. Maybe a set schedule isn't that big of a deal to you. Financial security is one of those that is always on the forefront of everyone's mind. Yeah, and we're in a unique situation where, you know, we're both trainers. Um, so my wife is also a trainer. Your wife is babysitting out of the home, you know, like, so like stay at home mother. Yes, we are not in a situation where a lot of people are like that we've met that are like, Oh, my so-and-so is a lawyer and I'm, you know, a trainer or this person is a doctor and I'm a trainer. Oh, my husband's a nurse. So I'm going back to school now, you know, or something like that. Or like, um, You know, like if so when we want to take a vacation, we have to take time off from working. So we're not getting paid. We have to pay for the vacation. You know, we're not getting any type of money for that. And it's our time. Like, you know, like so we're in unique situations where we don't have a significant other that's like, oh, well, I only only had five sessions this week or only 20 sessions this week. So, uh, you know, my check's a little light, but, you know, it doesn't matter because my wife or my husband has that set salary. And, you know, and their insurance, some on their insurance. So it's all good. doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, we're in unique situations where it's like, oh, we are trying to provide for everyone and everything. And, you know, it's, it's a little stressful sometimes. Yeah. That weight is always at least slightly on your shoulders, if not all the way. And, you know, I, there I'd be interested to know via email, if anyone could email us at inwardvesting at gmail.com, how many of you are the sole income provider in your family and a business owner, somebody who is completely responsible for that income. Now, that doesn't mean you're not responsible for your income if, you're, if you have a salary. That's just a different set of stressors. It's just a different life. It's not, not one thing better or worse. But how many of our listeners own their own business and are in a position that if you don't work or you don't produce, you go hungry. I want to know how many of you are out there. And I also want to know what is your biggest concern right now? Is it your schedule? Is it your hours? Is it the fact that you don't know what else to do besides the job that you're doing? I want to know that because I'm, I'm in this job because I chose it and I've had other opportunities to, you know, maybe do something else, but I did, when it comes down to it, I can't imagine doing anything else. So I have to expect, you know, I have to accept the, the pros and the cons, you know, the good and the bad. And I have to be willing to consistently move forward and never feel sorry for myself. I think that is a key ingredient that, the moment you start playing victim in any situation, that's the moment where you have completely relinquished the opportunity to do something about it and you, because you have relinquished responsibility for the predicament you may be in. I think assumption of responsibility is at the core of it. And certain people are cut out for it and some people aren't. I'll be honest with you. I think there are some people that do not want to be in the same position we are in or the same position that others are in. It's a very hard leap to make. 
it took me a long time to make that decision. And I'm not going to say that I am uh, one of those people that's completely cut out for it. You know, like I don't necessarily have a, you know, that's not one of my strengths, but I've developed it. I've forced myself to learn how to do it. I've become better at it. And I feel amazing, you know, about my decision. And when the goods are good, they're great. And when the lows are low, they're low. They're low, man. So thinking about when I could possibly take my next vacation, I have no idea. Like it, it, that's one thing I have to avoid thinking about sometimes is like, you know, going to Vail or Salt Lake City or, you know, go snow skiing for a week or two or doing something in Costa Rica with my wife, something that I would just absolutely love to do. So these are some of the things. That's also real quick. It's also real tough when the clients that are paying you like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to be here for the next two weeks because I'm going skiing. Yeah. I'm going across the world to <laughs> Thailand for two weeks to travel. Yeah. You know, we just, we just decided last night to just book the trip and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, nice. I've been thinking about a vacation for three years. I haven't gone on one. Yeah, my response is, uh, last night I cooked a hash. It was really <laughs> exciting. I was thrilled with the way it came out. But, I, you know, I also remember that you know, for those of you out there that own your own business, you're a sole income provider. Um, the, the, my daily job is awesome. They don't also get to do what I do on a daily basis. What I do is significant. We, we change the world every day. Every todos los dias, man. And wow. that's Spanish for every day, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Let's check that. But that's, I think, the big trade-off in life is, and why I think so many people are scared to leave a job that provides them security, that is unfulfilling. Sometimes, you know, I, I think there's three, three possibilities in your career. There is security with no freedom. There is freedom with no security. And what we're all looking for is that combination of freedom and security at the same time. Does that really exist? Uh, I, I'm sure at some level it does. You know, if you, you know the, the quote grind that we're on every day, um, you know, it'll pay off. I have faith in myself that it'll pay off and you know, I'm gonna have that freedom and security at one point. Yeah. I see people in the field with it and I, that's, you know, goal of mine freedom and security you know i've i've heard rumors over i don't know maybe five years now that there are certain bodies out there that are trying to lobby for insurance to cover personal training and immediately every personal trainer throws their hands up in the air yay and ready to throw a party like they would love for insurance to cover because that means more people but I also know from talking to physical therapists and some doctors and some people that I'm very close to about how handcuffing it is to work with insurance involved in their service. And yeah, some people have great experiences with it and some don't, but the overwhelming majority for me in my conversations have led me to believe that the ha having insurance not involved in the fitness industry allows us to have the freedom to choose the way we want to do things and the way we want to run our business without input on from somebody who isn't a part of my business or my daily schedule. So the reality is we have a choice. You can, in any career path, if you find that oasis of uh, freedom and security, fantastic. I, my guess is that you absolutely earned it. Um, I don't think that can happen unless you are extraordinarily your disciplined. passion and your purpose. Yeah. Because I think... And, and talent. Yes, yes. Probably talent mixed in there, too. Yeah, but, like, if you're living those two with, like, your talent, like... Because then I think, like, you will stop caring about, like certain thing and like not stop caring but like your life will be more fulfilled so that you'll feel like you know a vacation is going to train someone right 
I, yeah. Oh, great. I get to go train 16 hours today yeah. straight. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. You know, like we're living our passion, our purpose, like everything just else. Like you got your family at home. You got your, you know, you're going every day to a place you love and just that's what you were put on earth to do. And like, do you need everything else, anything else, right? Like, because it'll probably be giving you a comfortable life. It'll probably be giving you that freedom and security that you want and everything. So, like, if you're living your passion and purpose, using your talent and everything like that, like, I think that'll be that. That's the trifecta. Yeah. So, I think we have a couple action items here. So, if you're in a similar position and, you know, you, are, you feel like your career is a burden on you or you feel like, I shouldn't say burden, if you feel like you are not completely connecting the dots or things get overwhelming for you and... You know, I, I, we are taking a moment to be real with you. Now, none of this means that you're unhappy or you have to pretend that you're fragile. I'm not talking about, you know, a complete emotional breakdown. I'm talking about everyday thoughts and emotions that normal people have. Sometimes things are hard and we're going to struggle. So these are a couple checkpoints I think we can make when you feel like your career is one of your biggest stressors. Number one check your check your emotions and check perspective yourself. check yourself it, the word work plays tricks on us when you say i have to go to work i've caught myself saying like oh i got to go to work or i've worked work, 60 work, hours work, work, work. you know man this just sounds like this just sounds so much worse than saying well i get to help four people exercise that sounds really easy mm -hmm. um Obviously, there's a little more to it, but if you just change the way that you word things in your mind, like that's just a simple way. Just like, are you thinking about it like as a burden when you don't really have to, versus your actual daily tasks? Um, if you do the same amount of stuff on a Sunday, on a weekend, it's not as stressful because you don't think of it as work. I have to go here and help this person. I have to go there and do this. If you have five things on your to-do list, you're not thinking of it as a to-do list. I it's just stuff to. you're I doing that to. day. I get to instead of saying I have to. I get to. Another one is coping with stress in a, in a way that's biologically friendly. What do I mean by that? Emotional stress and phys physical stress have similarities. There's some commonalities between those two. One is raising your blood sugar. Uh, emotional and physical stress typically means oxidative stress in your body. Um, it also typically is catabolic, which means it breaks down. So if you're doing something like, uh, let's say, eating a lot of food, sitting on the couch, drinking alcohol for long periods of time on the weekend to quote unquote rest, you are doing things that actually still perpetuate those same problems. Heightened blood sugar, uh, oxidative stress, and it's, alcohol is absolutely catabolic and being sedentary is very not joint friendly. So instead of thinking about resting or becoming completely inanimate and throwing caution to the wind or discipline to the wind, doing things that actually help blood sugar are more anabolic, meaning it helps you grow or, um, or helps oxidative stress can help you out a bunch. So one way to do that is through breathing practice. Frequent breathing practice, like on the hour, three to five minutes of uh, three to five second inhale, three to five second exhale while laying on the ground, getting a ton of oxygen in your body, uh, changes your blood chemistry, changes your pH level, um, helps flush toxins. There's a lot of things you can do in just simple breathing practice that is biologically friendly that actually helps you recover from whatever chronic stressors, emotional or physical. Yeah, you can look up like box breathing or butieko breathing, B-U-Y-T-E-K-O or something like that. Like those are two different like styles of breathing. If you want to look, if you want to read more into that. Yep. Um, there's another one, Kundalini breathing. I actually have a couple of, I have some breathing drills in the F1 course for fathers who need better stress coping mechanisms. That's just one. Um, Another one, some joint mobility work. We do, we do exercises called CARS, which are controlled articular rotations. 
and that's going joint by joint through the body and doing they look like joint circles joints love circles joints love circles so one of the reasons is that um, you get the most sensory information in your brain from circular or rotational patterns versus one plane of motion using all of them in one so say my wrist for instance it's very friendly to the joint, especially if you just lock your wrists in a keyboard position while you're typing all week and going through some kind of circular patterns that are controlled, not moving any other joint but your wrist in a clockwise or counterclockwise circle. It's very friendly to the joint, allows uh, any scar tissue or damaged tissue, any stress tissue to move in a different pattern. Um, it helps increase blood flow in that area. And then from a sensory standpoint, it heightens your brain activity more than simpler patterns. So your brain actually is constantly mapping your joint capability. So you're also allowing your nervous system to do a more sophisticated body scan and allows your body to stay more mobile and looser on a regular basis. So a little analogy for that, Mike, that I got through one of the courses I took was if think about you from right now from where or listener wherever you are if you're at work or home wherever you are like going to another place like for you right now we're at work so think of one way to go home right so getting on the highway to Selman or whatever and now every other road is super thick fog right so you can't see so you only have one route to go right so that's like your normal joint path right like I move my wrist up and down and you know that's it so that's like you have one road one avenue to drive down but then when you do joint circles it kind of clears away all that fog so now you have millions and millions of possibilities there right so like when I do those weird ankle drills you know and then land on my ankles it's because I cleared all the fog away and you know now my body knows that like oh this is a safe route to take I can you know I can do this perfectly fine which helps with the tissue health and injury prevention and dude, those are just two simple things, three simple things that you can do to cope with stress in a much more friendly way. One more thing before we close it out, we're running out of time, but one more thing you can do is just make sure you're eating really good food. I know when you're stressed out, the first thing you want to do is go eat some junk food, but nutrients are actually aids to help us flush toxins and help regulate blood sugar and feel better. So you're not doing yourself any justice by over or under eating junk food. Um, eating really good food when you're in a state where you need recovery is ex extraordinarily important. So on that note, we have a few ways to help cope with stress in a much more friendly way that will help you feel better rather than worse. So we'll go ahead and close it out on that note. If you have any questions, send it to inwardinvesting at gmail.com. And this has been the Inward Investing Podcast with Mike Ritter, Todd Whalen, and Blaze Whalen. And we will see you next week.